So today, we've got Aaron O'Toole with us. Uh, he served in the Canadian Forces. He's a lawyer. He's a member of Parliament. Now he's looking to become leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Mr. O'Toole, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Great for having me, Todd. Okay, first question, I think coming from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation isn't surprising. The carbon tax, you've come out against it. If you become prime minister, how long will we have to wait for you to get rid of it? Is it before or after lunch on your first day? <laughs> it will be part of my first hundred days as prime minister where I'm going to eliminate the ideological anti-energy, anti-resource policies of the Trudeau government, Bill C-69, the tanker ban, I'm going to introduce a National Strategic Pipelines Act to get our, our Canadian resource to either tidewater or, or refinement capacity by cabinet approval up front. And as part of that, we're going to eliminate the Trudeau carbon tax and show Canadians that the Ottawa knows best approach uh, for climate change or any issue is wrong. We need to respect provincial uh, jurisdiction when it comes to the economy and, and decisions. And wherever we can partner with them on emission reduction, we will. But a tax plan is just that. It's a tax grab and we'll eliminate it. Okay, I'm going to move on to another, another one. The, uh, the Trudeau government has banned thousands of guns. Looks to be that they're going to be spending hundreds of millions, perhaps more, uh, to buy back those guns. What would you do with that gun ban and buyback? Well, the order in council was not just wrongheaded. It was actually undemocratic. To think that the, the Liberals use a pandemic where the House isn't even sitting and use an order in council to essentially declare uh, tens of thousands of Canadians to be non-law abiding by, by suggesting that their firearms, their semi-automatic firearms are somehow some big risk. Trudeau and Bill Blair shamelessly lied to Canadians. I, I have fired a military assault rifle when I was in the military. You cannot buy <laughs> Uh, military assault weapons in Canada. In fact, they use those terms to mislead people and to scare people who don't understand our regime. So I'll eliminate the ordering council and Bill C-71, which was also an unfair attempt to reclassify and to demonize law-abiding owners. I'm going to scrap the act and actually come up with a, a transparent and fair way to show Canadians that we have very effective screening, uh, uh, training, and licensing behind our uh, possession and acquisition license. We've got a very different regime to the United States and the Liberals own data shows that the challenges with firearms being used in crime come from illegally smuggled guns. So I'm going to put resources at the border with CBSA and with the RCMP. Okay. We're seeing a, a, uh, a deficit that's soaring. I just the other day used the uh, the shorthand dollar sign one and T for the debt one trillion dollars was the first time I've ever done that it wasn't a very pleasant feeling how would you address that soaring debt that huge deficit that massive challenge well we have to have a plan and show Canadians we're going to implement that plan right away and that's to get the deficit under control and to relaunch our private sector our GDP growth which Remember, before COVID, we saw tech resources withdrawing a program that would have been worth $70 billion over three decades. We saw Warren Buffett pulling out billions of investment from Canada after the illegal rail blockades. So Trudeau was already eroding our competitiveness and jobs and GDP growth. And now there is a looming debt crisis because if we don't get that, that deficit under control, we start adding to that one trillion plus amount and the fewer jobs there are and the less investment there is in Canada, we then have a GDP dropping or stagnant as a deficit debt get out of control. So we have to tell Canadians, our plan will get us back to fiscal balance over a number of years while we relaunch our economic growth. That will avoid not only a debt crisis, which Trudeau is setting us up for, it also preserves important social programs like healthcare and old age security. These are programs that Trudeau is putting at risk because of his out of control deficit and debt. The other side of the equation, there's gonna be people pushing for higher taxes as a way to solve this problem. What would you do to uh, manage that pressure? How would you address that pressure to raise taxes to try to deal with the situation? I will not raise taxes. And in fact, I've warned Canadians, this is what we're going to see from Justin Trudeau. 
when he was running a structural deficit in the 20 to $30 billion range pre-COVID, he was running that deficit despite raising personal income taxes, despite his war on small business, despite cutting the tax-free savings account amount eligible for Canadians, uh, putting an automatic tax increase on alcohol, taxing ride sharing. We used to call it taxing your Saturday night. I think you guys talked about that as well. He was already raising taxes across the board and was running a structural $20, $25 billion deficit. What's it going to be like under Justin Trudeau with a $343 billion deficit? Uh, We've got to replace them or their hands are going to be in your pocket even deeper. So I I know from being part of the, the Harper government, with a dedicated plan and with discipline to get spending down and private sector job growth up, we can balance over time, it will take some time, without raising taxes. What we need is those Serb Canadians that are on relief programs, we need them to have jobs so that they're not not just taking government support programs, they're actually contributing to economic growth, paying taxes, participating in the economy. That's got to be our goal. And I think if Canadians see we can have a balanced approach with no tax increases, but by getting Trudeau's out of control spending under control and eliminating his ideological anti-resource policy, uh, we can get Canada back on track. It's interesting you're talking about uh, trimming spending. It's one of those things that uh, is always easier said than done. Um, So I'd like to throw a specific example uh, at you. Uh, the government spending about $17 million to renovate uh, the Prime Minister's cottage at Harrington Lake. We did some checking around. You can get some pretty swanky cottages for way less than that. We're seeing Oscar winners and Stanley Cup champions paying less for their swanky vacation spots. What do you think of the idea of selling Harrington Lake? <laughs> I read Chris Sims' uh, column on that, at, uh, your BC chair, who I'm a big fan of and and proud to call a friend. I think she did put that in context. You know, what is shameful is many of these uh, additions and renovations appear to have been done without proper public disclosure. And that is scandalous. Uh, You know, uh, Pierre Polyev, our our, uh, colleague, did some great work on that. I think we have to review that, review all types of spending uh, of this nature, both in the National Capital Commission. And look, you know, we need to rationalize how any of these, these residents are handled. And I think there needs to be more transparency. Um, do, we, do we flip and, and uh, to get into some other arrangement? I, I'm not committing to that now, other than the fact that we have to put taxpayer first. Another big area of spending is corporate welfare. Uh, we're already seeing rumblings that uh, the Bombardier might want some more money. They often do whether you call it stimulus or corporate welfare or bailouts, what are your thoughts there? What happens if Bombardier or others comes comes knocking for taxpayers' money? I want to have a zero uh, uh, tolerance approach for corporate handouts and and, uh, that corporate welfare that we saw with with not just the Trudeau government and Bombardier, a kind of a favorite of that, but uh, MasterCard, luring investment to Canada with big promises of, of money when what we should do is just have a competitive environment. Now, don't be imposing carbon taxes. Don't be imposing regulatory burdens forever. That's what's driving capital away from Canada. We shouldn't have to bribe, beg and steal for them to come. We've got a very talented workplace. We've got great quality of life. Some of our cities are always in the top 10 list of, of uh, places to live. And, and we should be making sure we're competitive and attracting that investment without the incentive. Post-COVID, there's going to be some specific uh, industries on their knees and and how can we uh, um, help them to recover for that economic activity? I'm I'm willing to look at that, but not the the sort of graft and and corporate welfare we see from the Liberals. My my main focus is something I think you guys talk about as well as small businesses. Two-thirds of Canadians work for a small and medium-sized business. They were largely left out of Trudeau's massive spending. So the rent uh, support he promised has not materialized for virtually anyone. Uh, Owner operator businesses were left out of the loan program entirely. So I have a save small business approach, which is based on extending the loan, uh, 
changing our restructuring process so that we see businesses restructuring, not liquidating and, and just selling their assets and letting all their people go. We need to show some flexibility outside of COVID, but this, this dropping checks for people to cut a ribbon, a politician to cut a ribbon, I'm fundamentally opposed to. Let's talk about another area where a lot of checks are getting dropped, media bailouts, uh, money going from taxpayers to media. What are your thoughts there? I'm the only candidate that right away in the race came out and said the media bailout fund is ending under my watch. I'm also cutting CBC and I'm going to look towards privatizing uh, CBC English television, which is should have been done probably decades ago. But now when, when my phone that's charging here beside me, I, I can broadcast on that. I can listen to your podcast. My kids can stream Disney or Netflix. Why are we paying taxpayer money? I like to joke, why are Canadian taxpayers subsidizing a Canadian version of the family feud? I use that example to show just how ludicrous it is. And Trudeau's additional money to CBC TV and digital actually made the problem work worse for the private sector struggling to digitize their advertising budget. So then he puts a $600 million bailout fund, $1.2 billion, of government interference in the private sector. I'm going to end it all. And I think Canadians will be with me because I'll preserve some of the public interest language or CBC radio that doesn't have commercials. It's not competing with Chorus or, or Shaw or the private sector players. But the gargantuan budget with, with CBC English television is totally out of step. And it's time, time to bring some reform to the CBC. Okay, I'm going to take you in a different direction here. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of discontent in Western Canada to the point where Western separation is uh, it's an issue that's uh, impossible to ignore anymore. And equalization is a major part of that discontent. What do you do about equalization? Well, I'm open to looking at equalization and bringing the provinces together to make sure that the partners in our confederation, and that's how we should see one another, see that it's a fair and transparent process. And right now we've got several provinces that don't think that's the case and have valid reason because of calculations with respect to resource revenue, how baselines are tabulated, and then what is the sort of comparative nature of social spending across the, the country. That's wildly out of whack. And it's not just Alberta, it's also Newfoundland and Labrador wants, wants it to be looked at. And we need to reinvigorate and recommit to our federation uh, all the time. That's, that's our partnership. That's our family. I knew that this problem was, was out there, Todd, uh, for a number of years now. Jason Kenney is not just supporting me in this race. He's a, he's a very good friend. We're in touch regularly. I launched my campaign in Alberta because of Trudeau's erosion of national unity. And people notice that. That's why we've, we've had good success in Alberta. They know that a true blue conservative from Ontario who's committed to looking at equalization, eliminating the anti-energy policies of the Trudeau government, and respecting provincial jurisdiction. That's how our confederation should work. It's not Ottawa knows best. It's Ottawa should get out of the way a lot of the time and allow the provinces to succeed. If there's one area there where it might be more complicated than equalization, it would be the tax code. And I actually asked uh, the folks scheduling this uh, interview if there's any questions that they would like to put on the menu. And they picked a real good one, simplifying the tax code. What would you like to do there? I would like to simplify the tax code. In fact, I talked to our policy team about this um, at the beginning of the race when you know we thought naively we were only going to be dealing with a, a $28 billion uh, Trudeau deficit <laughs> when we replaced the government. Now it's a lot different. And, and what I want to do is, is bring together some tax expertise very, very quickly. Uh, people like Jack Mintz and others who've, who've praised some of the ideas I've put out there already on simplification. We've made it too burdensome for small businesses to keep up with CRA requirements. And quite frankly, CRA almost has a hunt and kill mentality with their audits of small and medium sized businesses. I want to end that. And simplifying it uh, recognizes that these small and medium sized businesses don't have armies of, of lawyers and tax accountants. We need to make sure that, that uh, people pay their taxes and there are the offshore havens and those sorts of things. But we should make it as simple as possible 
and as flat as possible with a recognition that we have a, a graduated uh, set of personal tax rules, but we should flatten those. And look, conservatives, we've even been involved in complicating things with some of our, our tax credits. And while they were always for valid things, I saw in Ottawa that, that that just encouraged more groups to pattern their issue as a boutique credit. And so what about we just simplify everything? That way you're not coming for a specific solution, but we're saying, hey, we want you to generally over time keep a lot more of your own money. And we know that that will have dividends by investment, expansion, uh, purchasing power. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in a more simplified, lower tax code, making us competitive in a global economy. Transparency is, is critically important across the board in every government. We've partnered with an Indigenous activist named Charmaine Stick. Uh, the Onion Lake Cree Nation, her home community, doesn't publish its, uh, its audited annual statements. So we partnered with her to go to court, basically because the Trudeau government doesn't enforce the First Nations Financial Transparency Act. What would you do with that piece of legislation? It's interesting you've asked this. Um, I want to empower First Nation leadership to take it over themselves. In fact, part of the challenge we find with, with this sort of slow and almost glacial pace of reconciliation and land treaty settlement comes from the bureaucracy in Ottawa. So if we're talking about respect for Indigenous leaders, and, and look, when I was in law school, some of my colleagues were uh, were young uh, First Nation lawyers, and, and now you, you see chiefs, including a chief in my riding, who are lawyers who are running businesses and development corporations. Let's take it away from the bureaucrats and actually have First Nations administer an accountability approach uh, amongst different bands. It will have the accountability, but it won't be that parochial sort of Ottawa telling you what to do. That's what I think people are tired with, and even some people calling for elimination of the Indian Act, because it has that sort of vestiges of the past. I've met some incredible ISO certified uh, Aboriginal business corporations. Let's empower a government governance body within Indigenous leadership to take care of the bad apples because of, of the hundreds of, of bands across the country, it's only a few dozen, as you guys know, that are the outliers. And I think by empowering a, an Indigenous-led accountability act, empowering an Indigenous-led uh, uh, claims resolution process, I think it will actually speed up and allow First Nations to have a bit of ownership over accountability, governance, and reconciliation, which to me is less about the symbolism of Justin Trudeau. It's more about participation in the economy of today so that young uh, Indigenous Canadians have an opportunity to benefit as a community for a resource project. I have a resource revenue sharing model in my platform, but also the jobs in many of these communities, whether it's diamonds in the north or, or pipelines in the west, there's an ability for Indigenous can Canadians to, to work, partner, and lead in these projects. And I think that's the future and we have to push it. I'm going to drill down on that just a little bit more. So what the leaders at the Onion Lake Cree Nation would say is that they're doing nothing wrong. And you're right that the overwhelming majority of First Nations comply with the First Nations Financial Transparency Act. It's a success story. It's wonderful. Most of them are complying. But for those few bad apples, Justin Trudeau isn't helping Charmaine Stick get transparency in her community. If you're Prime Minister, what would you do to help Charmaine Stick? Well, perhaps Charmaine can be one of the, the members of the board of this uh, First Nation-led transparency initiative. As I said, I think her voice and, and my friend Kathy McLeod, uh, an MP from Kamloops, have, has talked about her in the House of Commons and she's, she's a very strong and resolute figure and I admire the fact that she's been working with you. That's the type of leadership we need to have a governance model because I've talked to First Nation leaders and they always say that some of the outliers that don't want to comply Oh, they think it's a, an Ottawa knows best or it's an attack on nation to nation dialogue, these sorts of things. This is why 
there is capacity in terms of governance within First Nation uh, leaders, chiefs, uh, business leaders, development corporations, to monitor themselves. That way we take away this excuse that, oh, this is the Stephen Harper Accountability Act. It's only the bad apples that won't comply. So if we remove the sort of Ottawa politics from it and say, look, this is gonna be a governance initiative that's not just providing accountability, we wanna see the best practices in terms of financial transparency and oversight, both for on-reserve uh, initiatives and related development corporations, so that the members of the communities like Charmaine knows that there's accountability and then it can be just taken for granted. So I, I want to really see it be, uh, be led in many ways by Indigenous Canadians. So I'm very much a Ottawa get out of the way at times. Let's set up uh, a, a body that will succeed. It will remove an excuse for non-compliance. And perhaps Charmaine can be one of the first, uh, first board appointments. I'm going to take another step on accountability and, and give you a specific because everybody says they're in favor of accountability and then we see specific situations. In 2009, Liberal MP Michelle Simpson started publishing her own expenses from her own MP offices. Just put them on the website. She promised her uh, constituents that she would do it. But former Liberal leader Michael Ignatieff uh, didn't appreciate her innovation, put a tremendous amount of pressure on her to take that information off of the website. If you become a Conservative leader and one of your MPs decides to disclose uh, their own expenses for their own office on their website, how would you handle that? I think almost all of ours do, uh, Todd. Um, I certainly do. We provide a link to the to the the budget directly that uh, that the House of Commons provides. Um, I know because just recently the the new numbers were were updated, and so some of my my colleagues were even tweeting out the the, the link. Um, so that type of of transparency is an expectation of our party. And actually, I don't know any MP that that has resisted that or is not doing that now. I'm assuming almost all of them have that link directly now. We were doing that. Uh, I did that right after my by-election. I made that commitment because I replaced um, uh, Bevoda and there had been some issues about, uh, about spending. So part of my commitment was to, to put that transparency uh, up there. Now I think it's an expectation for, for all Conservative MPs. All right. I want to finish with one question that just it's kind of for fun, help people get to know you a little bit. And you've served in the Canadian Forces. I've never served. Thank you for your service. But from what I understand from movies, everybody who's gone through the military at some point in training or whatever, transgresses a little bit, maybe the boots aren't shiny enough, and gets some really emphatic constructive criticism, like that nose to nose. I think you know what I'm talking about. I think... Everybody I've talked to who's been in the military says that, yeah, that happens at least once. So I'm sure it's happened to you. Tell me the story about it. You get, you get reamed out. Yes, uh, I believe that's the technical term. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I was a young kid from, uh, uh, from Ontario that had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. And I said, I went off to Chilliwack, BC for boot camp. And boy, did that take that chip off my shoulder quickly. I had some uh, minor transgressions from here to here, both as a cadet at RMC. Um, uh, but one funny story was uh, I was late re returning to the ship when I was with my seeking crew on HMCS St. John's and we were in Trondheim, Norway. And we had kind of a, a curfew to be back in the ship. And of course we had been joining a Danish ship and a few others that we, we knew from training in NATO um, for some, festivities, you might say, and uh, we were getting back to the ship, but our ship was tied up uh, alongside another ship. So you had to cross across, I think, the Iroquois, and, and then our ship was, was tied up there, and the Iroquois was doing some sort of meeting on the deck, so I had to wait. So I was literally minutes late because of that, and uh, I got a tongue lashing from my, my air depth commander, John Riley. And then I was confined to ship for the next port visit, which ended up 
we were we were in Norway doing some NATO training. Then we came down to Ireland, and our port visit was in uh, Cork. And so the first night, um, the boardroom, the officers went in, went into town, and and one of them performed at a bar singing music. He was a very talented Newfoundlander. And so for the second night, the EXO of the ship and my major, the flight deck commander, said, "You know what? It's cruel and unusual." to keep a guy named O'Toole on ship while we're in Cork, Ireland. So they ended up granting me sort of a reprieve from my, uh, from my minor infraction. And I got to go out uh, for the second, you know, maybe the second night and the third day, because that was, I think, our last port visit before we were crossing the Atlantic coming home. And I always thought that was great. You know, it was my O'Toole name that kind of got me a reprieve so that I could go k kiss the Blarney Stone, which is located there. Maybe that's helped my political career, I don't know. But then to spend a night in an Irish pub with some of my shipmates was, uh, was great. But you know, the military, it holds you accountable. And when you get those, uh, those sessions where you're corrected, uh, you, you remember all of them, but that one's probably the most fun to share. Thank you so much. I, I think I've actually gone over time for you here and I know you're super busy. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to chat with us and, and great luck on uh, Stay Safe on the Campaign Trail. Well, thank you, Todd. Thanks for all the great work CTF does. It's appreciated.